This video is in support of the ever underrated Livingstone Lions. Link in the description to learn more and adopt a BB. Hello there, I'm a fruit line. I'm both underrated and overrated. We've had a lot of stellar games these last few years. Now of course there are the big boys that everyone sees, like Spider-Man 2, but there are hundreds more games over time that just slip through the cracks, be they indie game or high level hit. It's impossible to cover so many games back to back of course, so I'd best just stick with the usual method. In this video, we'll look at 5 relatively recent games that I consider brilliant, but criminally forgotten, unfairly hated, or just plain overlooked. I'm going to try and keep this within a certain time frame, so unfortunately as much as I want to talk about games like PlayStation All-Stars right now, I can't. You gotta believe. <laughs> no spoiler warnings this time, because in this case, I'm not going to be talking about them. Instead, let's just dive right into it. These are 5 underrated modern games. Neo, the world ends with you. Addicted to combat. We're already starting off on a note that may sour with some, but let's face it, this game wasn't the big shot we hoped it would be, and I'm willing to bet that the Switch remake of the original World Ends of You had something to do with it. If you want to experience that version, get the DS one. Don't be a spicy tuna roll. Neo 2 is a semi-direct sequel to the original Hidden Gem. The combat system against the sinister noise has been completely rejigged in that you rapidly swap between a larger team of characters instead of just two. two. Wrong game series, darling. There are dozens of ways to set up your teams, and new powers are constantly being introduced after pretty much everything you do. Collecting the pins is ridiculously addictive. Moreover, anyone on your team can use any power as long as they don't share the same attack button, at least not initially. The enemies you use these ever-changing powers from jump from being mere cannon fodder to larger than life. I swear this gorilla ate like 15 different teams before you fought him. And don't even get me started on the T-Rex noise. <gasps> Four. Now admittedly, I don't find the story of this game nearly as good as the original, and a lot of this is down to the characters. It's not a bad story by any means, it's just that the first game has such a high bar to cross, in terms of characters, intrigue and reliability. Indeed, there are some shining moments here and there, such as Naji. <laughs> she may be a bit over the top, like, well, an anime character, but she's quite fun to be around. In fact, this game is very good at highlighting individual character strengths a lot more, from Fret's ability to manipulate memories, to Naji's ability to dive into the subconscious mind. And Rin's? Well, I won't go into details, but it's very cool. Like Kingdom Hearts, you do need a little understanding of what happened before and who some returning characters are even early on. That said, even if you couldn't care less about the tale, the battle system is more than worth the asking price alone. Oh, and did I forget to mention? The music is gold class, have a listen. Park Beyond, fun first and foremost. One of my earliest video game memories is playing Theme Park on the PS1, even though, well, I cheated the hell out of it with the unlimited money code. The absolute power! I gave Planet Coaster a try recently, but somewhere along the lines it lost me, which is strange because I love Planet Zoo. Then Park Beyond randomly appeared on my Twitter timeline and it all changed. When I started, I didn't know precisely what it was that made this game so appealing. It's quite glitchy for one thing, although that's par for the course of most Tycoon Builder games, and compared to its rivals, it's ridiculously simple. In the end though, I think what Park Beyond gets right is the pure joy of building a theme park, and at the heart of that is the impossifications, from the iconic tripled ferris wheel to a lawsuit waiting to happen. Park Beyond lets you build things that no other theme park tycoon game would dare, and nowhere's this more apparent than the roller coasters. 
In most other games like this, I would just use preset roller coaster designs because I find building them too finicky and too strict. That's fine for those who prefer the challenge of the realism touch, but I'd rather make a coaster that splits into two over a lake, goes off the rails entirely, fires some of the cars out of a cannon, and then sends the other cars up a wind tunnel to join back together. Literally the only requirement is that the cars don't go too fast around sharp bends or into each other. Otherwise, anything you can imagine is fair game. And it doesn't stop there. Most tycoon games have a campaign of some kind, but the missions are often not very interconnected, just dropping you into a preset place and having done. Park Beyond, however, boasts a full story mode. To address the elephant in the room, the cutscenes, they look awful. But the acting is brilliant, and the story itself is fun as you stand up to a money grubber who always seems to do more successfully than the people that put their hearts into the work. In this mission, for example, you compete with him for land space before he can build a brand new parking lot. <laughs> Park Beyond is unapologetically charming and fun. It doesn't aim to be super realistic, but it also keeps everything a tycoon game needs to keep you engaged. It streamlines some of the frustrations of its rival while allowing for creative freedom, and it has the most bizarre crossover DLC in a long time. I mean, I get it, but I also don't get it. Wasn't that place supposed to be a death trap? Spin Frog, pure pastel practicality. You just can't please some people, especially when it comes to indie games. People want more Phoenix, right? So Brock the Investigator comes along, and everyone ignores it anyway. Similarly, people recently played Karurin on the Switch's Game Boy Advance service and loved it, but wondered why there weren't any modern sequels. Spin Frog comes along to fill that niche and gets met with positive critical reception to boot. But nobody buys that game either, you utter nitwits! Spinfrog is the second game from Studio Somewhere following their rather excellent debut game, Benito Days, a fully fleshed out take on Monkey Target from Super Monkey Ball. It follows a similar graphical style and boasts a similar jukebox of mellow music, this time with a French twist. And on a gameplay level, it's even simpler than Karoon in some places, while adding to it in others. If you've never played a game like this, the goal is to maneuver a persistently rotating craft through a top-down maze without touching the sides. You can speed up the wing rotation or slow the craft speed down, and there are items such as a hot sauce that slows down time when you stop moving to help you progress a little easier. Sometimes the game throws in missions to unlock the goal, such as delivering ice cream to the patrons, often delivered by the more charming characters. Tilly here, she's me. She's literally me. All of the characters are written to be as upbeat and friendly as possible. There's no arguments, nobody maliciously berates one another, and there's an air of intrigue to the tale of the frog copter in Plumtown. Each level also has a variety of sub-goals, from completing time trials to coin collecting. Completing them all results in extra levels, which is always a nice addition. I really appreciate how the game encourages you to collect the coins first. It's just the right amount of challenge to ease you into the other goals, while rewarding you with customization prizes. Spinfrog is by no means a complex game mechanically, but its levels can get deceptively tough. Never unfair, but most definitely challenging. It has a just one more go feel, combined with some stress reducing aesthetics. You won't even realize how much time has gone by. Studio Somewhere not only revived the game, they improved upon it thanks to a complete understanding of what made the original concept so fun. In a sea of games of frogs in them of late, this is the golden child of the bunch. What he said, Crash Team Rumble, much more than it seems. Here we go then, the entire reason this video exists. When I was first started to make this video, Toys for Bob, makers of Crash 4 and Spyro Reignited, had to lay off about 40% of their staff and became indie developers, not only putting future games in jeopardy, but also putting an already struggling game in the crosshairs, Crash Team Rumble. Unfortunately, at the more correct time of writing, the layoffs mean that Rumble can no longer be supported and the new content has come to an end. In my previous video on Crash Bash, I stated how many people seemed to hate this game before it was ever released, and all my points from back then still stand. 
This part of the video will hopefully convince you why Rumble is a much better game than people would have you believe, and also encourage you to support the studio that gave it to us, no matter how briefly. If not for Rumble, do it for Magnus! They invented him! Why can't he exist, Toys for Bob? Crash Team Rumble is often touted as a MOBA, but not only have the developers stated otherwise, the only similarities it really shares are the character classes and that some character abilities have cooldowns. Otherwise, it's a platformer brawler at heart. As one of the three kinds of characters, scorer, blocker, or booster, you platform around collecting things and try and turn it in at your team's bank or the relic stations to activate powers. These powers range from character cameos such as Gulp, changing your character's movesets with a big ball, and summoning this absolute unit. <coughs> to briefly sum up the roles, scorers run around smashing crates and collecting Wumper Fruit, the main thing you need to win. Collect 2,000 and you win. Blockers act as goalkeepers who try to stop the scorers from turning Wumper in. And boosters contribute a little Wumper too, but they mostly collect relics of which they can collect more of at once. They are also tasked with locking down the gem platforms. Each group of gems captured makes the Wumper Field team more valuable, but a fight is sure to break out over them. Rumble also boasts a party mode, which can be a little repetitive, but turns classic crash platforming into mini-games, from racing around an assault course... I'm both scared and lazy. ...to collecting and throwing ingredients into Dingo Dar's blenders for his unusual diner snacks. Rumble has a wonderful roster of characters. Those who returned from Crash 4 have had their movesets tweaked to be more easy to pull off and more combat orientated. In the case of Coco, she's finally a completely different character, and not just the Crash clone. She's able to spiral spin through the air and create electric walls which protect her and her teammates. There are a host of new characters too, all of which are immense fun to get around as. I've always thought that Rumble is like blending Crash Bandicoot's platforming smoothness with the open areas of Spyro the Dragon. No wonder Spyro's crew fits in so well. Even their animations are fun to watch. Look at the way the little Laura skips about. Rumble is easy to pick up and hard to master. The stages encourage creativity in your platforming to find the fastest collecting route. And the character's moveset transition ideally from simple traversal to heavy combat in a crowded area. At a high level, this game is something marvellous to behold and its hidden depths truly shine, with the competitive war games being the peak of the bunch. Not to say the game is perfect, it does have some lag troubles from time to time. But these aren't as common as they used to be, and more often than not, it leads to a good laugh rather than any frustration. Crash Team Rumble is a passion project of a game. There really is nothing else like it, but unfortunately, it didn't do as well as it could have because everyone wants Spyro 4 or a Bash remake instead. With any luck, Toys for Bob will give it a second lease of life in the future. Perhaps packaged with the next mainline Crash game, you never know. That said, the servers are still live indefinitely, and I would still love to team up with you guys there. See you soon! Where's the kaboom? And now it's time for some honorable mentions. Brock the Investigator, Accessibility for All. If you're wondering why this game looks a little different, it's from the Android version which was just released recently. I've already made a passing nod to this game in my Emotional Moments video, but I'd be remiss not to bring it up again here, because it's truly as underrated a game as it gets. The efforts of a single developer, would you believe it? It blends a deep, surprisingly dark story with a creative merging of genres, fun characters, and all of the best parts of the Miles Edge of Investigation games. Well, except for Gummy, but we have a big fat dad doll, so it balances out. It continues to update with gameplay additions and fan art, and even became one of the first games an entirely blind player can complete from start to finish. Now that is forward thinking. Rock knows what it wants and achieves it with flying colours. As many people as possible need to experience this almost perfect video game, and thanks to the accessibility options, they can! Kingdom Hearts 3 Dives Deep This game just turned 5 years old, so I didn't want to put it on the main list in case it's no longer considered modern. That's 5 years of people saying it's the worst game in the series and to stick with 2. I get it, believe me, I get it. As a diehard fan, the story is not up to the standard we're expecting and nor is the acting. But on replaying the game recently, I realised I was far too harsh on it. 
The graphics are gorgeous, the music is grand, but most importantly, the combat is a lot deeper than it seems, particularly on critical mode where even the very first boss shows no mercy. It also makes the best use of the Disney IPs in a very long time, perhaps even since the first game, correcting the power scaling so that they can stand up to the evil Organization 13. Yeet is Benitas, anyone? Team Sonic Racing – Potential with poor timing In an era of stellar kart racers like Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled and being able to play as Death in DreamWorks Kart, Team Sonic Racing was always going to struggle from the moment of the green light. Not even Vector could save it. Team Sonic Racing emerged in the shadow of its older brother, Sonic Racing Transformed, which remains a 10 out of 10 experience. It was simply too high a bar to cross, but that doesn't make the new sibling any bad. Team Sonic Racing should be praised for trying to rejig the typical kart racing formula into something fresh and creative, but also something that stays true to the Sonic series, the real superpower of teamwork! Unfortunately, a low online player base and some strange design decisions from Sega mean that this game couldn't take off, even though it truly is at its best, with four teams full of human players. It desperately needs a sequel to find its full potential and draw in the crowds it deserves. Which brings us to the last game on this list. Fuser! Endless until it ended. This game is so underrated that it no longer exists. That's more than enough to give it the number one spot and gives me the perfect excuse to talk about it. I apologize for the big watermark. Unfortunately, it's what happens when capturing from the Switch version. We live in a time where people no longer want plastic instruments or bongos, and we're far past the time of grubby dance mats and, heaven forbid, motion-controlled dancing games. The rhythm genre is in a strange place these days. We haven't seen a new rhythm paradise in ages, and most games prefer to blend genres now, such as Soundfall. Enter Harmonix. They created a one-of-a-kind experience to teach you how to be a DJ. Exit Harmonix because nobody bought it. Fuser is a DJ simulator where you slap down both well-known and new songs. There are four parts to most songs, drums, bass, melody and vocals. You can mix them however you wish, even using more than one type. Yes, that includes four lots of vocals, if you absolutely must destroy everyone's sense of hearing. It sounds simple, and at the start it is, but it also has a lot of hidden tricks. Fuser kicks off with one of the best solo campaigns I've ever seen, let alone in a music-driven game. Each chapter gradually teaches you a new trick that you can use to make music of your own, from soloing diss tracks to adding custom beats and bops to shifting into a completely different mix. Fuser teaches you to mix the songs in the best possible way. It also lets you just go ham while nudging you towards goals that it knows will make you better. On a basic level, you could just follow the coloured markers on the timeline for the ideal time to slap a disc down, but Fuser rewards both newcomers and experts alike for experimenting with their timings. Fuser is the perfect video game in that anyone can pick it up and have fun, while it also naturally nudges you into becoming an expert. In its prime, it had community challenges where you made mixes that fit themes and cheapest chips DLC, unlocking even more possibilities in mixing. One new track had the potential for hundreds of outcomes. Not bad for two quid. Unfortunately, a mix <laughs> of poor sales and licensing headaches means that Fuser can no longer be purchased anywhere, unless you get seriously lucky and find an unused key. It truly is a shame, because aside from Um Jam -a Lammy on the PS1, Fuser is without a doubt my favorite rhythm game. It's one of a kind, has thousands of possibilities, has a killer track list, and was as feel good as a video game can get. And at the end of the day, video games are there to make us feel good, right? What? I said that you could mix the songs any way that you wanted to, didn't I?